say every week that if you are a parent and your children are in worship and they're doing the children job of making noise and moving around, that is a joyful noise <laughs> and very, very welcome at St. Andrews. So thank you, parents. Let us pray. Wait, wait, wait for God. Wait, wait, wait for God. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Be strong and let your heart This is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. Forget the news, the radio, the blurry screen. This is the time of loaves and fishes. And one good word is bread for a thousand. One good word. Those words by poet David White make me think about how we show up online or in person for worship because we are hungry for a good word. And on this day, when the scripture calls us for the eyes of our hearts to see and to have wisdom, may we know hope. Hope is a good word. It's the word we need when someone we love or we are struggling with loss or illness or change or depression. Hope is the word that we long for in a time of climate crisis, in a time of war, in a time when we see restrictive laws aimed at LGBTQ plus people or others, we long for hope. Jesus' ministry on earth showed humanity that life, life is the point. Jesus' way showed us connected, loving, vibrant life is the way that we are all invited to. And this life is not based on those cultural values that we have of competition and gain, but they're based in compassion and humility. I say this almost every week, but we at St. Andrew are on an interim journey, a time of change and transition, a liminal time. The letter to Ephesians, written by a follower, a disciple of Paul, was also a liminal time. That letter was an encouragement in the midst of cultural forces that swayed a stressed people away from God. In the same vein, the Apostle Paul urged the church in Philippi, let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Self-emptying love was the very core of Jesus' life, his death and resurrection, ascension, and the model, the model for us today. So I was thinking this week about humility. That word humility is problematic <laughs> for a few reasons. First of all, 
there's a lot of false humility. And by that, what I mean is the message that some of us got in childhood, which is, you're not special. Don't toot your own horn. Because somehow that would be hurting others. In reality, we are each created in the image of God. Each of you, each of us, are special. Marianne Williamson said it beautifully, and she was later quoted by Bishop Desmond Tutu. She said, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are born to make manifest the glory of God in each of us. It's not just in some of us. It's in everyone. And we let our light shine, and as we do that, we give permission for others to do the same. That's how the light gets in. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Jesus lived authentically who he was. And we are called to that same authenticity. And when Jesus left this mortal life, he reminded his followers that we carry the same light, the same love, the same power. Perhaps this is the best good word that we could hear right now, that true humility, the kind of humility that causes us to love others, to a unity of purpose and care. I never had really thought about this before, but humility connects us. It's, it's pride that separates it's pride that isolates. Pride is interested in the self at the expense of others, but humility recognizes our connection with all. Our world, our church, our places of work, our communities are still trying to figure out how do we live together in this pandemic and post-pandemic world. Over these last few years, some people have quit participating in the life of St. Andrew. Some people that we knew and loved have died. How do we find humility in this world of loss and suffering? In some meetings we've had recently at St. Andrew, we've done some really hard work of listening listening to different views, different concerns and experiences. And at times, we may feel that we are losing something very familiar and very dear because of change. But here's the good word. When we experience a loss, God's love still holds us and it is frequently in loss and change that we are moved to learning deeper compassion and action. Christ's love empowers us to give up something of ourselves for the sake of relationship. That makes me think about my friend, Ann Huntwork. Ann was a peacemaker. I met her over 20 years ago in a house church community. She knew about literally giving up personal freedom for the sake of others. 
She went to prison for six months for her continued protests for peace at um, Fort Benning, Georgia, at School of the Americas. She marched, she sang, she wheelchaired into her 80s near the end of her life because she believed this passage, look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Anne's life witness wasn't always received by others as uplifting. A few members in her own church were upset with her protests and prison time. We know that there are powerful things at work in all our lives which can destroy the gift of unity, but the power of Christ's risen love makes us whole. I'm just wondering if you've ever noticed in your own life how love turns strangers into friends. Can you see that? If Jesus means anything to us, if Jesus' spirit is even at the smallest corner of our hearts, we need to let humility, true loving humility, be at the core of our unity. So a few years ago, I had the great privilege of a poetry pilgrimage with poet David White and a group of others in Tuscany. Thirty of us from different nations met in Florence to spend the week together, to hear David's poetry, to write poetry, and to take long walks through the countryside, getting to know each other, meditating. We came from Singapore, British Columbia, Pittsburgh, Mexico City, New Zealand, Whidbey Island, California, and Kansas. It was a diverse group, teachers, nurses, artists, two Olympic athletes, a yoga teacher, a Zen priest, administrators, business leaders, and a minister. All of us were drawn by the poetry. But even in the company of wonderful people, it can take a lot of energy to listen, especially with strangers. Self-interest can interfere. First of all, there's the whole travel thing and being out of your comfortable context, right? So personally, I'm remembering, I wasn't the pastor, I wasn't the mother, I wasn't the singer. On the first day of our gathering, the nervous little child in me was wondering, who are these people <laughs> I'm spending the week with? What if no one likes me? I noticed as we loaded up into the three vans that dropped us off at our hiking spots, I needed to sort of draw myself back and not grab the front seat every single time. <laughs> At meal times, I stopped myself, very hungry, from going to the front of the line and getting the best views every time. I hate to admit it, but I think when we're faced with uncomfortable situations, that jumping in and elbowing out to get your way first is sort of a natural inclination. Going for the self rather than caring for the other. But a very interesting thing happened. The more we broke bread together, the more we shared stories and listened to one another, the more we genuinely cared for each other. Over the course of that week with my new friends, I also was reminded not to make snap judgments I learned to listen more and to speak less. As they say, God gave us two ears, but only one mouth. Some people who I thought were difficult became my best friends. Some people who appeared to be perfect had deep challenges in their lives. 
We learned about each other's losses and fears and hopes. And in the course of walking many miles together, we had some difficult times and some beautiful experiences. So one day, the vans drove us through the Chianti region. And as the vans veered around curves and up through the hills, I looked out the window of the van, and I saw a single man in this vast open field with a tiny little weed whacker. <laughs> I thought, what in the world is he doing with just this tiny little weed whacker in this gigantic field? We continued to drive up to Volpaya, a hill town, and we parked, and then we started a 10-mile walk back. As we walked, we walked sometimes alone, sometimes in groups of two or three, and that's how we really got to know each other. It was hot, it was a long walk, and as the day ended, we were thirsty and tired and hungry. As the sun was beginning to set, and it just felt like, okay, I can't go any farther, we turned the bend, and we came upon that very field we had passed. And there in the cleared out spot was a beautiful long table spread with water and Chianti and meats and cheeses and breads and olives and oil, and chairs were set up facing a glorious sunset. The butcher who laid out the table welcomed us literally with open arms. It was a feast to share with strangers who had become our friends. Unbeknownst to us, love had been working all afternoon to surprise and delight us. And after our long, thirsty walk, we were invited to sit and eat and drink together and to soak in all of that beauty. It's that way at this table, as we gather as friends and strangers. One good word is bread for a thousand. And here's another good word, life the fullness of Christ who fills all in all reminds us of life, life together, the body of Christ. As we continue worship, I invite you to think of your moments of vibrant life, maybe right here in this congregation, maybe with friends, Maybe a time with family. And if you can't think of that memory, then let's think forward. This feast is for us. I'm going to close with a poem that I wrote. Here is how to love life. Hold it as tenderly as a mother carrying her newborn, warm with sleep. Feast on it with loved ones, with strangers, even people you don't agree with. Let the flavors melt on your tongue. Sing it with a grand chorus, letting your soul shimmer out. Paint it with bright colors, really pausing to see without preconceived notions. Dance all night with it, letting the beat vibrate through you, making your sternum hum. Sit comfortably in silence with it, breathing deeply, trusting that all the love you give and receive shapes what we have and share. We make life together. <laughs>